Hello, everyone. The 11th of November is just around the corner, and that means all online stores and marketplaces are starting. A grand sale of everything. Yes, there was a time when the sale really made sense, and we bought products with real discounts. Now it's just a fake. We all know perfectly well how this works. A few days before the sale, prices start to rise, and by the start of the event, they drop back to the original. I think that's clear to everyone. But since the event is so hyped, I decided to take the opportunity to make a video on the topic Top Useful Modules for Radio Enthusiasts. A few clarifications right away. Most of us are familiar with these modules, and they are not new. In the description, you'll also find links to purchase the reviewed items. By purchasing through these links, the author will receive a small commission, and this will help support the channel's development. So, thank you in advance. We will be looking at general purpose modules, and not all of them. Devices with narrow applications, as you understand, don't make sense to review because they are not of interest to everyone. Well, let's get started. It would probably be worth starting with the most popular modules for electronics enthusiasts, the MT3608 converter board and the TP4056 charging board for lithium-ion cells. Well, who hasn't heard of them? These are well-known popular boards, so I'll skip them, but I'll leave the links in the description. Power supply. Various DC-DC voltage converters, both step up and step down, are used by us for a wide range of tasks, for powering loads that require non-standard power for powering LEDs, charging batteries, and even for building laboratory power supplies. These modules can be divided into two large groups, step up and step down. Both types can provide the ability to smoothly adjust both the output voltage and current. As a rule, these are high efficiency switching converters. Here is a classic step down voltage converter based on the popular LM2596 chip. Small, inexpensive, with the ability to adjust the output voltage from 1.5 to 35 volts, with an input voltage from 4 to 40 volts. It's important to understand that for a classic step-down converter, or more precisely a regulator, the output voltage cannot be less than the input voltage. That's why they are called step-down converters. There is a separate class of converters called CPIC, which can both step down and step up the input voltage. Let's return to our module. It's suitable for powering small loads with a current up to 3 amperes, but it doesn't have the ability to adjust the current. However, there are identical modules, but slightly more expensive, that do have the ability to adjust the current. You can distinguish these variants by the number of trimmer resistors. Such modules with current stabilization are suitable for building small chargers and for powering LEDs. There are high power options. Here, for example, is a step-down voltage and current stabilizer based on the XL4016 chip. The input voltage range is from 5 to 40 volts, and the output is from 1.2 to 35 volts with adjustable capability. And the current can reach up to 8 amperes, or more precisely, from 100 milliamperes to 8 amperes. In theory, the efficiency can exceed 90%, and the power of 300 watts is sufficient for building powerful charging devices and powering high-power ultra-bright LED matrices. However, if you plan to draw more than 100 watts from the module, you need to attach a fan. Many people use this particular device as a basis for making laboratory power supplies. It's not the best solution, because the output voltage ripple and the voltage and current adjustment not starting from a pure zero make it far from the best option for a lab power supply. And here is its boosting counterpart, built on the basis of the old but incredibly popular TL494 PWM controller. The Chinese claim it to be 400 watts. The input voltage range is from 8.5 to 50 volts, and the output is from 10 to 60 volts, with an output current from 200 milliamps to 12 amps. Although some greedy sellers claim it to be 15 amps. It is clear that, similar to the first stabilizer, with power above 100 watts, the native passive cooling won't cope, and an additional fan is needed. This module is in high demand, especially for powering LEDs, as powerful matrices are usually quite high voltage, while the available power source is typically low voltage. For example, 12 volts. Such a module will raise the voltage to the required value, and due to current stabilization, it becomes possible to set the necessary current, which is specified in the documentation for the selected LED. 
It is important to note that although there is current stabilization here in such boost converters, for a number of reasons, it will not function properly in cases of, for example, short circuits or when connecting low resistance loads. So if you thought of making a lab power supply with this thing, I'll tell you right away, it's a bad idea. The problem here is both with the current and the fact that the output voltage cannot be lower than the input voltage. I also highly recommend powering such devices with a voltage of no less than 12 volts. There are similar boost converters with even higher current, with power in the kilowatt range and above. But they are not in high demand, so we won't consider them. However, if you're interested, there's a detailed review of a one and a half Chinese kilowatt boost converter on the second channel. If you need a very high voltage, the Chinese have a solution for you. A boost single-ended flyback converter with an output voltage from 45 to 390 volts. The input voltage can be from 8 to 35 volts. But again, I recommend powering it with at least 12 volts. Here, only the voltage is adjustable and the module is intended for powering various high voltage things and for experiments. Keep in mind that the output voltage is constant. The output power is 30 watts, up to 40 or 50 watts temporarily, and that's if you attach a fan. It has protection against short circuits, which in most cases doesn't work, because the Chinese often, instead of a shunt that is supposed to provide protection, attach an unclear metal strip. But overall, the topology is not bad, but all these are converters that convert DC to DC. Now a bit about power. Supplies AC-DC. These devices are designed to convert network alternating current into output constant. Of course, in the assortment of manufacturers from the Middle Kingdom, there is an innumerable variety of all sorts of switch mode power supplies. I am only considering low power ones, which, as a rule, I always have in my arsenal for different tasks. I have been buying these power supplies of various capacities for a long time, which are sold as used. Experience has shown that these are the internals from decommissioned power adapters. And most importantly, they are very reliable power sources with a range of protections. They have a very good input section with a line filter, a fuse, and varistor protection against overvoltage. In some cases, there are also protective suppressors. As a rule, these are single-ended flyback power supplies on specialized PWM controllers with an additional external power switch. They provide high-quality secondary power with a high efficiency of stabilization and low noise. Fast and adequate current protection operation. They may have protection against feedback, disconnection, and in some cases additional stabilization of the output current. As a rule, they have a fixed output voltage of 5, 9, 12, 15, or 24 volts. Practice has shown that such sources can operate at maximum power in a closed adapter case 24 7 for a very long time. So, I recommend them. Recently, electric transport is gaining momentum both small and large, as well as alternative energy sources in the form of solar and wind power plants. Nowadays, many people are assembling various batteries for alternatives in electric transport, and, in many cases, nickel strips are used for assembling these batteries, which are welded to the cells using the spot welding method. There are a lot of different types of spot welding machines on AliExpress. Typically, they come in network and portable versions, powered by high-current batteries or supercapacitors. There are also separate controllers available for both networked and portable machines. In the first case, the controller, equipped with smart electronics, controls a powerful triac, ensuring the switching of the welding transformer at 220 volts. In the second case, the controller's electronics manage an array of powerful MOSFET transistors, through which the main welding current flows and they are forced to briefly withstand hundreds of amps of current. Both types of controllers are generally single pulse and dual pulse. The first pulse is usually short, so to speak, it sets the tape, and the second pulse is the main welding pulse. Unlike MOSFET controllers, network controllers allow for the adjustment of not only the welding time but also the current, since the power triac in them can also function as a regulating element and similar controllers, adjusting the current is not feasible because the current is enormous and the only rational solution is to manage the welding time and the number of pulses. Both types work well if everything is done correctly. 
Personally, I can recommend a ready-made budget solution using two polymer batteries connected in series. Such welding can easily work with nickel and nickel-plated strips of 0.2 mm. However, there's a catch. It often happens that their batteries are either used or old from the start, and these polymers already have a limited lifespan about 100 to 150 cycles. In that case, I can suggest converting them to lithium iron phosphate cells like these. We connect them in series, and everything works like clockwork. The capacity is enormous 22 amp hours compared to 3 or 5 amp hours in the case of factory batteries. But the lifespan of lithium iron phosphate is much higher, up to 6,000 cycles. However, you will also need to make a separate charger with a balancing system, because the voltage of iron phosphate differs from that of polymers. Such welding can operate in manual mode, a single press on the pedal leads to welding each time or in semi-automatic mode, press the pedal and hold it. Each time the device detects that the electrodes are closed, after a short delay, the welding will start and you won't need to press the pedal each time. Since we're talking about batteries, I recommend a cheap battery capacity meter, which I also reviewed. This gadget will allow you to discharge the battery to determine its capacity. If you watch this video, it will become clear how to turn this simple meter into an almost full-fledged electronic load with discharge current stabilization. The board is quite versatile, allowing you to set the battery discharge termination voltage between 1 and 11 volts. Overall, you can connect batteries with a voltage of up to 15 volts. The maximum discharge current is 3 amperes with a step of 1 milliampere. The display shows the capacity delivered by the battery in ampere hours, the discharge current in amperes, and the voltage applied to the battery in volts. After discharge, the device turns off, and the capacity delivered by the battery is displayed on the indicator. Ready-made lithium assemblies require protection boards. These boards often provide protection for the battery from deep discharge, overcharge, short circuits, and overheating. In some cases, they have an onboard balancing system to equalize the voltage across the cells. The functionality of such boards is practically the same. They may differ only in that they are made for different types of lithium, and they also come in different current ratings from a few to hundreds of amperes. Such boards are used in budget assemblies for small electric transport, like hoverboards, bicycles, and so on, as well as for converting old power tools with outdated nickel batteries to modern lithium. More advanced options can synchronize, for example, with a smartphone and display all battery parameters, in real time with the ability to edit protection and charge limits. There are also standardized BMS boards specifically designed for assembling batteries according to the popular standards of top manufacturers like Makita, DeWalt, Bosch, Matabo, Milwaukee, and so on. As mentioned earlier, many such boards have a balancing system on board, which is an important component designed to equalize the voltage across the cells. It is generally used during charging. Without balancing, the battery's lifespan is reduced and the battery may not deliver all its effective energy, as due to imbalance, some cells may discharge faster than others. And the BMS board will disconnect the battery output due to one severely discharged cell. The problem is that built-in balancers are generally designed for a low balancing current, ranging from 70 to 150 milliamps, and are set up to dissipate excess voltage on the cells, converting it into unnecessary heat released on the resistors. But that's only half the problem. If the assembly has a large capacity, then the average 100 milliamps of balancing current is clearly insufficient. That's why active balancing systems exist. They can be universal, supporting many types of lithium batteries. The number of series cells also varies. Unlike a passive balancer, which converts the excess into heat on a resistor, an active system transfers this excess from a more charged cell to a less charged one, so energy is not wasted and nothing heats up. This kind of board is designed for a balancing current of 5 amps, which is orders of magnitude higher than built-in balancers, and it ensures a perfectly even charge on the cells down to thousandths of a volt. The downside is the price. The cost of an active balancer is much higher, but it's worth it. 
Lithium batteries are widely used in many industries, including various backup power sources. Power bank is one of the types of such sources. Often, ready-made, power banks of low and medium cost, and in some cases even expensive ones, have an inflated stated capacity. Therefore, many electronics enthusiasts prefer to make homemade power banks. The Chinese are leading in this area as well. They offer us separate modules and cases for homemade power banks. One of the quite good options now is in front of you. This is a small budget board that provides voltage conversion from a single lithium cell of 3.7 volts to 5 volts for charging your gadgets and also ensures the charging of the power bank's battery from any 5 volt source. All of this is done on a single chip. In this case, it's the IP5306. It's a smart chip that in addition to everything, ensures charging. The battery with a stable current up to 2.1 amps provides protection against deep discharge, overcharge, short circuits, and also displays the battery charge level with four LEDs on the board. And all of this with minimal external components. The maximum charging current. For your gadgets can reach up to two whole, four tenths of an amp, and the module's power consumption in sleep mode is less than 100 microamps. And all of this, for one and a half to two dollars retail. It's important to note that this is a highly efficient synchronous converter with an efficiency of up to 90, 92 percent. Of course, there are a million different varieties of such modules from the Chinese, with a display with support for fast charging at 150 watts and above. It all depends on the amount you're willing to spend. Let's step away from power supply a bit and move on to the eternal, classic amplifiers and various effects. We all started with this. Here are simple and very cheap little modules that will help you in the task of integrating into your old receiver, music, center, or homemade amplifier with modern conveniences like Bluetooth. Just connect power to the module. The module's output to the amplifier's input. Find the device via Bluetooth. Start. The music. And that's it. Quick and cheap. There are modules with different versions of Bluetooth with a three and a half millimeter headphone output. There are also versions already with a power amplifier for building homemade portable speakers, for example. In the old days, we would spend days, weeks, and sometimes months etching boards, searching for components, and creating our first power amplifiers. Now it's much simpler. For mere pittance, the Chinese will provide you with quite decent Class D amplifiers that also have Bluetooth on board and everything else. Buy a power supply for it from the same Chinese sellers, a case, and that's it DIY ready in an hour. Or you can forget about everything and buy a ready-made option with it and Class D, A, B, or pure Class A. Of course, in that case, the whole point is lost. The enjoyment of the process of assembling and tuning a DIY project, the agony of defeat, and the triumphant jubilation. But what can you do? Many radio enthusiasts eventually abandon this unique activity. Others convert into radio destroyers refiners, while true enthusiasts, from time to time may set it aside, but at the first convenient opportunity, they pull out the dusty soldering iron from storage and bring it back to life, along with all the memories. On that note, it's time to wrap up this video. As always, you'll find all the useful information in the description. And with that, I say goodbye. As always, this was Kazyanov Ka. And until we meet again, bye.